Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. The Unfortunate Death of Martin Stephanopoulos by Jacob Wyams Martin was walking across the lawn in front of City Hall when a strong gust of wind dislodged the flagpole from the roof and impaled him through the top of his head, skewering him to the ground like a grim lawn ornament. There was a debate over how best to handle the situation, and ultimately it was decided to bring in a crane to remove the flagpole with Martin still attached. The other option was cutting him off the pole while he hung in front of the building, but that was deemed too unseemly to do in such a public setting. Unfortunately, it would take three days to get the crane in from out of town, so the sheriff organized his deputies into shifts to guard the grisly scene from onlookers and vandals. I had the poor luck of being assigned the first night protecting the deceased. My time with Martin started at 11, and I was not early. The deputy I relieved checked his watch and nodded at me as he left to climb in his truck and head home. It was a cool night, but not cold. Stars shone down on me from the clear, black velvet sky. The tarp that encircled the body flapped gently in the frequent breeze. There was often a wind that blew down from the mountains into the valley that surrounded the town. It kept the air crisp and clean in your lungs. I always enjoyed being outside in the valley, especially at night. Before I settled into the folding chair I brought with me, I went to check on our unfortunate resident. He stood upright in the middle of the tarp circle, his weight supported by the makeshift javelin piercing the length of his body. I shivered once at the sight, then let the tarp draped closed. No need to dilly-dally with the poor man. Assured he would not be going anywhere, I sat down in my chair and tried to let my mind wander to things less ghastly than the skewered man. Coyotes howled in the distance, and the thought crossed my mind that they would probably enjoy the shish kebab I was guarding. The idea of a kebab for coyotes made me chuckle. It stuck in my head like a bad joke and caused a quiet, rolling laughter that I tried to contain. As I sat, trying not to be overly rude to Martin, a sharp voice called out to me, Hey, this isn't funny. I was immediately sobered of the joke and began to look around, frantic for the source of the voice. At last check, I was the only person in the area. Well, the only living person. My eyes widened as an impossible thought crossed my mind. I stared at the flap of the tarp gently rustling in the wind for a moment before I gathered my nerve and edged closer, sure that the late night and too much coffee had affected me. Before I got to the enclosure, the voice called out again, Don't be rude. You're supposed to be here to keep me company anyway. At least come in here and talk to me. This is some kind of sick joke. The rough texture of the tarp made an audible crinkling sound as I pulled it back far enough to allow entrance. Even though I had seen the body earlier, it was still a shock to see it again. It was still in the same position as before, with the pole struck straight through the pitiable man and continuing into the ground. There were a couple slight changes from before, though. Martin's head was twisted around so he could face the opening of the enclosure, and his face was contorted by a wide grin. I stopped short and fought the bile back down into my stomach, still furtively searching for some explainable source for the voice. To my horror, I saw Martin's grin shift to allow his lips to form words, and I knew where the voice had come from. Now that's better. Wouldn't you rather look a man in the face when you're speaking to him? I attempted to compose myself, but the effort fell flat. Y- y- yes I suppose it's more polite this way. His face pulled back into that gruesome grin again before it fell back and he continued, I'm glad we agree. I have a last request if you would be so kind. Of course, I said. My initial fear faded as the conversation turned almost normal. Fantastic. The last request of an already dead man. Nothing weird or horrifying about that. I watched as Martin's arm slowly twisted around towards his pocket, every movement fighting the rictus state he was in. His muscles sounded like giant rubber bands that were being pulled too far, threatening to snap at any moment. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to pretend I was anywhere else in the world, at the beach, watching the palm trees sway rhythmically, sway rhythmically to a disgusting, unnatural sound. I shook my head to clear the thought and opened my eyes. Martin had finished searching his pockets and produced an old, worn writing pen. 
I stared at it with a blank expression for a few moments before I realized Martin wanted me to take it. I used that to write letters every week to my daughter that lives in New York. It was a gift she gave me when I finally finished college, and I think she will appreciate it, he said. Sure, that's really nice. Um, Martin? I stumbled over his name, unsure what the etiquette is when addressing a man you have never met until after his death. Thanks for the approval, deputy. Now, if you don't mind, I would like to be left in peace. I started to mumble something about giving him some space, but he suddenly started to move again. His arms moved up over his head in the same jerky motion as before, complete with stretching rubber band sound effects. As I stood before him, he painstakingly pulled himself up the flagpole, one hand over the other, like a macabre reversal of a fireman's pole. When he reached the top, he gave one final mighty pull, cleared the top, and tumbled to the ground like a rag doll. Then he got to his feet, gave me one final sideways look, and shambled off into the night. The last I saw of him was batting the tarp away from his face before he disappeared from my sight forever. I stood there, stunned, for a few minutes, watching the tarp blow in the cool breeze of the night before I turned and noticed the bright crimson streaks his body had left on the dull white of the flagpole as he hove himself up it. My gaze fell to the worn silver pen in my hands, and then I had one final thought. Oh God, how am I going to explain any of this to anyone? I am definitely getting blamed for losing poor Martin's corpse. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. Bit of a long one for you today. It's not really much of a point of making the rules if you can't occasionally break them, and much as I tried to move these two stories around and put them with shorter pieces to keep the range of this episode more within our normal, the more I realized these two stories had to live together. So you get a little bit of extra bonus content today is the way I'm choosing to think about it. Jacob Williams kicked us off with the unfortunate death of Martin Stephanopoulos. I was asked a while back, and I'm not sure by who, one of the places where we list calls for submissions, how often writers make their publishing debut on our show. And the answer is I don't always know because I don't carefully read the bios before I select the pieces. I read them afterwards. Um, and so it doesn't really matter to me when a story comes in what the publishing history is. It more matters what the story is, and then we go from there. But Jacob Williams is making his publishing debut with us today, so that's really exciting. And it's fun to follow that up after last week's show, because Devin Millette, who made her publishing debut with us back in April, was back again on last week's show. So it's kind of fun to, to catch these writers at the beginning of their careers. I will definitely have my eye on them and see where they are going from here. So that's an exciting phase to be in on. I like all of the themes and stories that we do on this show. But I have to tell you, there is a special place in my heart for the funny ones for a lot of reasons. They're fun to record. It's fun to listen to. It's fun to piece them together. And also because I don't think there's enough space in the quote unquote literary publishing world for funny stuff. And so when we're able to bring the humor to light, it makes you feel like these stories are getting a home that they might have trouble finding elsewhere. It was a delight to tell you the story of poor unfortunate Martin Stephanopoulos. Coming up next, CSO Canada brings us cost of living which is sort of along the same lines the story of what happens to the remains after death or maybe it's about who really has your back at the end of the day and who doesn't not sure which but i'm gonna let her read the story to you and i'm gonna let you figure that out for yourself and i will see you next week here on no extra words you guys take care Cost of Living by C.S.O. Canada. What's with the stiff? It's a body. I can see that. My question is how it came to appear on your living room floor. It's a long story. I've got some time. Can we get into this later? No. Why? The blood is staining the sectional. I see. And the cat's fallen asleep on his face. Oh. It's undignified. I get that. 
I guess no one really starts off the day believing they're going to kill someone. At least no one in my corner of the world, a small-town satellite of a larger urban planet, all of us circling around for work or entertainment or maybe just for a gravitational pull that will keep us from flinging ourselves out into the universe in a mad fit of boredom and regret. Murderers for mob bosses and former playboy bunnies with an axe to grind, not for dignified wives of software executives. But here I find myself, with a bottle of bleach and a collection of garbage bags trying to clean up the mess of my own transgressions. The matter of disposal poses the greatest issue. I cannot very well leave him here. Choosing to bash his head in with the heel of my new Jimmy Choos was a poetic yet poorly conceived choice. I will surely be blamed, if only for my ostentatious choice in footwear. "'You should have used a clog,' said my mother. "'Then they would never know it was you.' I could have been a clog girl. If I hadn't quit my job to keep the home fires burning while my husband went out and lit fires of his own, I could have donned sensible shoes while I went about my sensible life with my own sensible achievements, like a real person, instead of a paper-cut-out piece of origami gracing the windows of my lovely home. <laughs> but I digress. Here I am talking about myself, and I haven't even got rid of the body yet. Burying it in the back yard is not an option. My azaleas wouldn't live through it. We'll have to throw him in the river, I tell my mother. Great, she says. I always wanted to throw him in there anyway. My mother is a special woman, more like a mentor than a mother. Children were a social experiment she conducted as an unbiased observer. I believe she expected us to prove the null hypothesis, that is, the children really aren't worth it all in the end, and there is, in fact, lots of things like a mother's love. For instance, the love I felt for my first dog, Rocky, who was so stupid he ran into the sliding door to the deck at least once a day, or the love one feels for chocolate or a nice peppery Shiraz, both of which beat hands down spending even one day of a vacation with a surly teenage girl. <laughs> in any case, she's always been in my corner, my mother although not the most maternal type. When I had my first child, my mother-in-law sent word she would come stay with me. My mother sent a Filipino nanny. The nanny ended up sleeping on the pull-out couch. Eventually she would end up sleeping with my husband. That was the beginning, but certainly not the end of my humiliation. The day I found out, I bought my first pair of $800 shoes. He won't fit in the car. What do you mean he won't fit in the car? I only have the two-seater. The smart car. The ozone's depleting. No, it isn't. In any case, he won't fit in the trunk, so what do we do? Perhaps we can use him to plug the ozone. It gets easier after a while, trading trust and fidelity for clothes and credit cards. You convince yourself of anything if your cleavage is low enough and your Botox is never allowed to wear off. Although I was never quite sure if the inability to appear surprised any more by my husband's affairs had less to do with my increasingly callous attitude and more to do with the loss of the use of my facial muscles. But regardless, I found it easier and easier to look the other way. That is, until today. I don't see why we couldn't have put him in the trunk, I complain. My mother is driving. I'm too nervous. We would have had to cut him in half. Would that have been so bad? Maybe not for him. It's creepy like this. He keeps falling on me when you take a sharp turn, and I can feel his blackberry poking at me through the garbage bag. He's not wearing his blackberry. I put it on the hall table. Then what is that? It— Oh, God, that's just gross. Those things are expensive. God help me. I don't usually drop by unannounced. It's not done where I come from. My mother divorced her first husband for dropping by unannounced. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. Today was different, though. Today I had on a Vivian Westwood wrap and a pair of gorgeous Jimmy Choo's with killer stiletto heels. Dramatic foreshadowing in fashion is my forte. I wanted to show off to my new best friend, Janelle. She lives one block over, in the new subdivision where family values in the form of a huge mortgage and a postage stamp lawn can be had for seven hundred grand and the removal of your soul. 
Janelle is younger and fitter than me, looking great in anything, which makes her a prime target for my undying admiration and sincere need to destroy her. Janelle is house-poor, as we say out here in the suburbs, meaning she and her husband put more stock in having an impressive home than any other less pressing issue, such as sending their kids to college or having enough to eat. She's always been jealous of my fabulous wardrobe, and I couldn't resist a chance to drop by for a cup of java with a side order of jealousy. You're standing on my foot. I'm sorry. I thought he'd float more. I threw a couple of stones in when you were throwing up. I wasn't throwing up. I had a coughing fit. You have vomit in your hair. No, I don't. The door standing ajar should have been my first tip. No one leaves their door open in our neighborhood unless they're crazy or having an affair. I don't know why. It's just the way it is. Perhaps people are too busy to shut the door in the mad dash to get to the bedroom. Perhaps their love-making blows the door off its hinges. I don't question these things. What I did question was what over two dozen shopping bags from Yorkdale were doing in Janelle's living room when I knew she couldn't afford so much as a sock from Juicy Couture. That's when I heard them. The moaning, the clawing, the screaming. It was disgusting. Actually, the screaming and the clawing was coming from me. I couldn't help but attack those bags and yank out the contents. Shoes and handbags sailed into the air. Dresses and blouses were torn from their tasteful tissue wrap. When the two of them came running down the stairs, I had a Holt Renfrew bustier in my hands as I tore at the bodice with my perfectly veneered teeth. I came for coffee, I said, my mouth full of black lace. Then I ran home. I could tell you the rest of the story, but I think you can fill in the blanks. Woman runs home, man runs after her. Woman pierces man's skull with stiletto heel, yada, yada, yada. I won't bore you with details. Suffice it to say that I called my mother immediately afterwards, and she came and helped me. Herself. No hired illegals this time. I've got to give her credit for that. She was always cool in a crisis, or really in any situation for that matter. Heartbreak, disenchantment, murder, none of it fazed her. I think she had her feelings removed along with her appendix at twelve. "'It wasn't about the sex,' I sobbed when we were back home and done. "'I know, dear. He bought her all those things. Yes, dear. What will I do now?' "'Well, first you're going to have to replace the sectional. That stain is never coming out. I'll get on it. I knew you would, dear. You've always kept such a nice home. Money can't buy you love, but it can buy you time. Years of it, actually, spent with a veil pulled over your eyes of the finest fabrics as you walk through the fog of your existence in your shiny new black boots. Only don't pull the veil back, even for a second, because only then will you see the true cost of your shiny new life. I knew you would, dear. I knew you would. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.